Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. Today, we're travelling through the mines of Moria, the ruined kingdom of the dwarves, home to the great Balrog known as Durin's Bane. I should have planned this better so that this could be a Halloween episode. Last time, we started an examination of the three routes that the Fellowship of the Ring could have used to cross the Misty Mountains. The Gap of Rohan, a mountain pass, the Pass of Caradhras, a ridgeline, and the Mines of Moria, a cave system. In that last episode, we looked at passes and ridgelines. In today's episode, we're going to look at cave systems. First of all, let's look at the three main ways that caves can form. The first type of cave is an erosional cave. That's basically an umbrella term for any depression in a rock formed by physical erosion. Things like sea caves, rock shelters, and natural grottos. The mines of Moria definitely don't fall into this category. They're much too big. In the book, Gandalf describes the mines as being 40 miles long, about 65 kilometers. The longest erosional caves I could find any evidence for were some sea caves on the coast of New Zealand, which are about a kilometer deep. So we can cross that one off the list straight away. The second main type of cave is a lava cave, formed, as the name implies, from lava. A thick, flowing channel of lava is going to cool from the outside in, meaning that you'll often wind up with liquid lava flowing through the middle of a solid tunnel of rock. If the lava flow stops and all of the lava on the inside escapes, you're left with a hollow tunnel called a lava tube. Lava caves can also form in other shapes, like inflationary caves which are formed by bubbles of lava, or pit caves which are formed when a volcano doesn't quite erupt. Lava caves have been used in some fantasy novels to justify underground dwarven homes. The dwarf capital of Trondheim in the Inheritance books is explicitly stated to be built inside an extinct volcano. But they aren't a likely type of cave if you're looking for a way underneath a mountain. Lava tubes could be big enough to support Moria. The longest one in the world is Kazamura Cave on the big island of Hawaii, which is 65 kilometers long, the same length as the mines of Moria. But since lava tubes are formed by flowing lava, they usually make their way up the flanks of a mountain instead of passing underneath. To have a lava tube pass under the Misty Mountains, the tube would have to form before the mountain did, which doesn't make a lot of sense. The third and most common type of cave, the type which people usually think of when you talk about caves, is called a solutional cave. They are usually found in carbonate rocks, including limestone, chalk, dolomite, gypsum and marble, and sometimes in natural deposits of rock salt. All those rocks are soluble, permeable and alkaline. They dissolve in water, water flows through them easily, and they react with acids. Most sources of natural fresh water, especially rainwater, are slightly acidic because they contain dissolved carbon dioxide from the air and acids from decaying organic matter. What that means is that water can seep through cracks in those permeable alkaline rocks and create very strange patterns with the combination of physical erosion from the water and chemical erosion from the acids. Those reactions between acidic water and alkaline rocks is where you get all those weird rock formations people usually associate with caves. Things like stalagmites, stalactites, flowstones and other such oddities. They're formed by the water escaping the cave and leaving some of the dissolved rock behind. Solutional caves are by far the longest type of cave. The greatest total length of cave in the world is the Mammoth Cave system in Kentucky in the USA, which is about 650 kilometers long, 10 times longer than Moria. And solutional caves can actually pass underneath mountains, at least in theory. This is most likely to happen when there's a river flowing through the area. The river will drop underground and pass through the local cave systems. For example, the Reka River flows underground for 38 kilometers through the Scotchyan Caves in Slovenia near the Italian border, much of it theoretically navigable in a small boat. There's no river through Moria, but perhaps it's dried out. But the mines of Moria probably can't be a solutional cave either. One problem is that most of those soluble rocks are white or yellow in color. The film of Fellowship depicts all the stones of Moria as black or grey, while in the book the 21st Hall of Khazad-dum, the hall which connects to Balan's tombstone, is described as being carved from black stone. 
Black marbles and limestones exist, but only in coastal areas where they've been mixed with coal-forming sediments. The mines of Moria are very much not coastal. The other issue is that the mined parts of the mines of Moria were established to mine for mithril. While mithril is a fictional metal, it has properties similar to gold and platinum, metals that you won't find inside solutional caves. There's only one area of the world where you will find any useful deposits of metal at all in a limestone cave region. The Scowl landscapes in the Forest of Dean to the west of Gloucester in England are reasonably rich in iron ore. Mind you, J.R.R. Tolkien actually went on archaeological expeditions to the Forest of Dean, so maybe his experiences were a bit biased. So if the mines of Moria don't fit into any of the main classes of natural cave, maybe they're largely an artificial construction. The dwarves of Middle-earth are fabulous underground engineers, of course, but would it be possible to actually build something like the halls of Khazad Doom underground? You might think that these halls would collapse under the weight of the mountain, but while we don't have enough information to precisely calculate how much weight these pillars can hold, they're probably pretty strong. It all has to do with the almost magical support powers of archways, which can hold a tremendous amount of weight. Even a simple flat archway, or set, can hold an underground mine tunnel open, and the properly built archways of an undercroft can hold the weight of an entire cathedral. In fact, the reason that natural caves can stay open is because they usually form in the shape of an archway. In theory, limestone caves could exist at depths of up to 3 kilometres below ground, the deepest known cave accessible from the surface is Krubera Cave in the country of Georgia, which is 2200 metres from its entrance to its deepest point. As depicted in the film, the great pillars of Khazad-dum certainly seem to form into pointed archways at the top. So while we don't have enough information to calculate it exactly, we can presume that the 21st Hall of Moria probably won't collapse in on itself. But there's another problem with Khazad-dum, at least as depicted in the film. It's sheer size. You see, if you want to build a large underground structure, the easiest way by far is to dig a big hole and build up from the bottom. That's one reason that skyscraper construction starts off with a big hole in the ground. Actually carving structures out of the ground is much more difficult. I did some very rough estimates on my Tumblr, there's a link in the description, and Bertha, the widest diameter tunnel boring machine ever built, would take more than five years working at maximum capacity to excavate the volume of the 21st Hall of Moria. I don't even want to guess at how long it would take a bunch of short blokes with pickaxes to do the same. <laughs> So all that we've established so far is that Moria is pretty implausible from a geological and engineering perspective. But is that actually a problem? This is an issue where my scientist side and my fantasy author side are in conflict. My geologist side gets massively annoyed by these implausible cave cities, but my fantasy author side doesn't really care. Instead, the fantasy author side gets annoyed by the imitators. I've spoken before about how fantasy stories are built out of conceits and shorthands. Sometimes those conceits come from the real world, but not always. And one of the really common non-real conceits is the idea of a dwarf. After Tolkien built the archetypal dwarf out of various Norse and Germanic legends, fantasy readers have come to accept that archetype as being, well, set in stone. So my problem becomes not so much how did the dwarves build these underground cities, as it is why is every dwarven civilization so obsessed with building underground cities? I'm hardly the first person to observe that while trolls come in all shapes and sizes, and elves at least get split between Tolkien's tall ones, Santa's short ones, and the occasional Celtic-inspired fair folk creepsters, dwarves are always pretty much dwarves. Sure, some good authors have written interesting takes on the culture of the archetypal dwarves, and some funny authors have written hilarious parodies of the archetypal dwarves, but they're vastly outnumbered by less good authors whose dwarves are, at best, like Tolkien's but with one or two differences. My closing advice to fantasy authors here isn't so much about building passages under mountains, it is about how to write their inhabitants. Caves and passages that pass underneath mountain ranges might be implausible, at least in a world which can only use medieval technology, but most fantasy readers seem to accept them as entirely normal. 
On the other hand, the idea of dwarves is so oft-repeated, so heavily deconstructed, so commonly parodied, and so utterly cliched that I've gotten pretty sick of it. I think that if you're going to write something with dwarves in it, it isn't enough to just change one or two things. Almost every take on dwarves has been done. And if you're going to write a gigantic cave tunnel that passes underneath a mountain range, maybe have a look at what other creatures live inside caves. That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography. Please stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. You can find full scripts and an Ask Me Anything box at fantasycartography.tumblr.com. You can like my page on Facebook and you can follow me on Twitter. You can also email your questions to fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic and your cartography be fantastical. Most limestone caves are formed by fresh water which becomes acidic thanks to carbon dioxide in the air, but there's one really weird cave in New Mexico which was formed thanks to underground gases. The Lechaguilla Cave in Carlsbad Caverns National Park appears to have been formed when hydrogen sulphide, formed in nearby deposits of crude oil, escaped into the limestone and reacted with fresh water to form sulfuric acid. It's full of bizarre and unique variations of your typical limestone cave features, formed from the bottom up instead of from the top down. Unfortunately, it's generally closed to the public. Bye.